If they're not going to pay, we're not going to protect, okay? But one of the heads of the country stood up and said, does that mean that if we don't pay the bills, that you're not going to protect us? I said, that's exactly what it means, exactly. I'm not going to protect you. And we got our allies to pay their fair share and bring it in over $400 billion to NATO. They weren't paying their bills. You've been reading about it. Mitch McConnell says foreign aid is one of the biggest issues the U.S. has faced in a long time. In an exclusive interview with The Hill's Alexander Bolton, McConnell said that he got more Republican votes in the Senate than he expected on that foreign aid bill, despite former President Trump's opposition. Now, the foreign aid bill's future, particularly for more funding for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, is in jeopardy in the House of Representatives. GOP House Speaker Mike Johnson has lambasted the legislation, even as moderates discuss ways to outmaneuver the politically weakened speaker who is ruling now on a razor-thin Republican majority. Joining me now with the latest is The Hill's Alex Gangitano. Alex, thanks for joining us. Uh, will this pass in the House? Uh, Leader McConnell actually seems way more optimistic, perhaps, than other folks in the House of Representatives. Yeah, I think Leader McConnell is... Uh, optimistic because of the pressure on Speaker Johnson now. You know, he, um, as you mentioned, has these razor thin margins and has gotten a lot of pushback from the fact that he has been flip flopping on, you know, does he want border security in the bill? Does he want a separate bill on border security, which he considered dead on arrival? Now he wants it in this Ukraine package. It's all, you know, something that I think McConnell finds dizzying as well as the White House. And so I think pressure from both of these sides is why uh, McConnell's optimistic here. You know, something that's interesting about the fact that McConnell has been, you know, so supportive of support for Ukraine, has been on the side with the president on this, um, it has a lot to do with his history. Um, but also the president and McConnell, you know, they're creatures of the Senate together. They're old friends. McConnell has this uh, health history with polio and and when he was freezing up, remember that earlier uh, this year, um, Biden was the first to call him saying my old friend is doing fine. So they have this relationship that Speaker Johnson is so new to that, you know, he's really the outsider here that can feel the pressure, I think. Well, you know, and that's a great point as it relates to, to what you were saying about the relationship between Biden and McConnell. And in this interview that Bolton got with McConnell, he talks about how his father, McConnell's father, served in World War II as a foot soldier fighting against the Red Army in Czechoslovakia, writing home to McConnell's mom about just how horrible uh, Russia and the Russia aggression is. And, and McConnell notes that historically speaking, there has traditionally been a divide in the Republican Party about whether or not uh, to join entities like NATO. Trump was on the trail the other day talking about how if, if NATO wants protection, they need to pay their fair share. This is a historical fight that is not new to the U.S. in terms of foreign policy. Am I right, Alex? That's right. I think McConnell is really showing his old historic roots here as a veteran Republican leader. He really has never really bought into the Trump's isolationist America first concept. You know, during the four years of the Trump administration, there was, you know, a push and pull between um, McConnell and his thinking versus the Trump America first thinking. And I think that, you know, McConnell on a lot of these foreign policy, um, like we've been talking about, is siding with Biden here, especially when we see Trump on the trail talking about, you know, uh, that he's going to tell a leader like Russian President Vladimir Putin that if he wants to go after any member of a NATO country, if they're delinquent, um, then he wouldn't stop him. You know, this is stuff that McConnell does not agree with. He's a different brand of Republican. So him supporting Ukraine aid, as you mentioned, has this personal family history. I think another point that I would make is is that McConnell is the other is the brand of this old school politician that politics is personal. You bring in this family history. You bring in, you know, your years of expertise. Joe Biden is the exact same kind of politician. And these, you know, people like Speaker Johnson, even Donald Trump, um, you know, politics is politics. They're trying to win at the end of the day. It's a horse race. And I think that it just shows this different brand of governing.
Well, and if that special election up there in Long Island the other day, if that taught us one thing, it's that those moderates won. The moderate Democrats. And by the way, there's a message there for the far left flank in terms of the protesters and whatnot that the squad has been putting out with regards to foreign policy. Long Islanders, in AOC's backyard, mind you, neighbor, uh, chose a moderate. So meanwhile, speaking of that, the U.S. is set to reportedly hold Palestinian state talks in the coming weeks. So what's the White House saying about these talks? Yeah, so the White House has been in um, talks, of course, about the hostage deal. They've been over in, in Cairo um, discussing how to get uh, the Israeli hostages out of the Hamas's hands, you know, and then they've also been having these conversations with Netanyahu about, you know, hold back on, on all these casualties among uh, Palestinian civilians. So these talks are ongoing. You know, Biden, something's got to give here because, as you mentioned, these ceasefire protests are following him around the country. Even now, we're seeing senators break with him, Democratic senators who are allies, saying you need to do more to support Palestinian civilians. You know, this is getting out of hand. How much is too many deaths? We actually saw uh, just yesterday the president issued um, an executive order that will allow Palestinians who are already in the U.S. to stay. Um, you know, of course, um, unless there there's a point to say unless they're you know, criminals or um, pending any, you know, something that would would allow the U.S. to to kick them out. But um, at this rate, you know, he's trying to give nods to, I think, the pro-Palestine community in the U.S., um, because things are just so tense right now because of his pro-Israel stance. Meanwhile, former President Trump is back in court today, this time for Stormy Daniels up in New York. He's going to be making an appearance there. And in Fulton County, a judge is weighing whether the district attorney, Fawny Willis, should be able to keep working on the case despite having affair, an affair with one of the prosecutors. So I, I, I read all of these headlines. And then, of course, this tracking the Supreme Court. It's been a pretty good couple of weeks for Trump on the legal front, has it not? Yeah, that's right. You know, he seems to, uh, of course, not lose any popular popularity among his base on any of these uh, legal uh, situations, which, of course, we figured would be the case. But he's also, you know, the Fannie Williams situation is a positive for Trump because, you know, if the prosecutor um, and her had this special personal relationship, let's say, um, that's something that the Trump team is now really leaning into and saying, um, maybe that this is grounds to just to just uh, end the whole case, you know, or also get her off of the case. So in Georgia, that's a really closely watched situation now with this extra uh, add on that, you know, Willis is no longer, um, you know, scathe free. You know, the, the Trump uh, party is now going to try to um, discredit her even further um, in terms of his situation in New York, you know, the hush money case with Stormy Daniels, um, the Trump team is going to try to say that this is a so-called zombie case, meaning that it's six years too late to um, have interfered with uh, the his first bid and now his 2024 presidential bid. So they're trying to dismiss this case as well. I think that's a really closely watched one. Of course, the president, it's in his is his hometown now, um, his former hometown, I should say, excuse me, in New York City. Now he's a Floridian. So um, he just was arriving there as we were chatting. So um, both of them very closely watch, but we'll see how much Trump can keep dodging here in a legal sense. You know, Biden is only the second U.S. president who's Catholic. And uh, yes, uh, earlier this Ash Wednesday was this week, right? And Valentine's Day on the same day, mind you. But, but speaking of Ash <laughs> Wednesday, I, <laughs> he was asked yesterday in, in one of the press gaggles what he was going to give up for Lent. By the way, I'm trying to give up potato chips just for the record, but I, I don't want to, I'm trying. That's, that's the, anyway, I, yeah. I'm, I'm off script now. Okay. Back on message, Kev. But he was asked, the president was asked what he's giving up for Lent. Uh, and he said, reporters, <laughs> Alex Gangitano. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. He responded, you guys, when yeah. the press asked, what are you giving up for Lent? Which is, you know, he loves going to having this back and forth kind of joking with the media. This is classic Biden. Um, thinking that that's a, a fun joke. But um, it is funny considering two years ago, he said he's giving up sweets. We know Biden is a, a longtime ice cream lover. So that one was more <laughs> tangible, like you giving up potato chips. But him giving up the press is also funny at a time when 
The press has been constantly asking for him to do more press conferences, get out in the spotlight, especially in light of, of people questioning his age and memory. So we'll see if, if he was just joking or if maybe the White House will overcorrect now and maybe give us a press conference. Well, you know what they say, there's always a, a tinge of truth in humor. Thank you to The Hills, Alex Gangitano, <laughs> for breaking down all the headlines. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Kevin. And that's it for today's Daily Debrief. My name is Kevin Cerilli. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel and come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.